As um, Jessica said, my name is Malaka Kotman. I'm from the University of Kansas Libraries. We've been using archive space since 2014. And uh, I've been a trainer for about that long. <laughs> um, training on lots of stuff. My favorite is the um, agents um, and uh, I'm actually looking forward to the new agent thingy, even though we probably won't use all the features, but it's nice that it's there. Um, I also love workflow efficiencies. If there's a workflow efficiency, um, I usually investigate it. And, and uh, I like to do things quickly because I want to get it off my plate. So the objectives for this workshop are uh, working with global repository and user preferences, um, we'll learn how to set up some default templates and default values so that you don't have to, for example, keep putting in English. Um, it gets very annoying. Working with the controlled value lists, uh, using tools like rapid data entry and everybody's favorite new tool, the load via spreadsheet, to add archival or digital objects. Um, if we get past that, that'll be great. Um, after that would be merging agents and subject records and doing some container work via bulk uh, operations. But if we don't get to those two, that's fine. Um, I think everybody's probably here to see the load via spreadsheet <laughs> tool, but I want, didn't want to do it first because then you guys would all leave. Um, if you haven't already, go to the um, uh, Google Drive. Uh, this here is the uh, Biddy. Uh, URL that you could use. Open the document called Workshop Machine Assignments Workflow Efficiencies Online uh, Forum 2020. Find your name. It's in alphabetical order. You could double click the URL to actually open it up um, next to your name. And as Jessica said, the username is admin admin. Um, if you've logged into this website at any time uh, using admin admin in the past, you'll probably be warned that you're uh, <clears throat> um, password is a terrible, awful password. Just ignore it. Um, so I guess we could go ahead and start. Um, as Jessica said, there's a very large uh, 74 pages manual. Um, we're not going to go through page by page, but every once in a while I might uh, tell you what page I'm sort of kind of on. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to talk about are the global repository, um, global repository and user preferences. Uh, there's several things that are helpful in that. It's under, so you could click on system. Oh no, it's under, it's under where your name is, which today is admin, but tomorrow it'll be your name. We got global preferences, repository preferences, and user preferences. If you set something up in a global preference, that means it applies to every repository in your instance. If you set it up as a repository preference, then the preferences only apply to that repository. And for those two, you have to be a system administrator or a uh, oh, whatever that other one is, a repository manager to be able to see them. The system administrator will see the global, the repository manager will see the repository. User preferences, everybody will see, and those override any preferences you may have set up globally or in the repository. Um, go ahead and click on repository preferences if you want to follow along. So, this is what the screen looks like. Like all good archive space pages, it has navigation down the side, um, which can be helpful because then you could just click on, oh, I only want to worry about the search columns. And so you get right there. The general settings portion is where if you have suppressed records in your instance um, and you click this, then everybody in that repository will be able to see the suppressed records. Kind of defeats the purpose of the suppressed records, I suppose. Um, but um, if you want people to be able to see those records, this is a, the only way to do it. Publish. If you want every record that you create to automatically have the publish checkboxes checked, then you could put your check mark here. Um, 
If you use the public user interface, I don't recommend having that set because you're still working on the record. And so people would see it and it's not done and they would get all a Twitter and ask silly questions. So yeah, you might want to leave that off. We'll learn more about pre-populate records uh, when we uh, work on the templates, but uh, what it does is if you don't have this checked, even though you set up a template, then it won't it won't populate the, the template won't actually populate your records. Now this language selection is the language of the interface. Currently English, French, Japanese, and Spanish Castilian, which is really just Spanish, um, are available as uh, if you change it to German, then all these words would be in German. That's all it does. So it's, it's not the language that's actually in the resource record that you have to set. Next up is note order. <clears throat> Sometimes it's helpful. Um, for example, in my institution, we have all of our notes set to display in alphabetical order um, in the staff module. This only controls the staff module, controlling the order and where notes appear in the public user interface is done through the public user interface module. So um, we have our notes appear in alphabetical order so that you have a snowball's chance to find things when they're very, when you have lots of notes, you could go, oh, well, this note was usually at the end. So then I'll scroll to the end of the document and then go up. So if you were gonna do that, to move these around, you see the three lines? Those are hamburgers. That's actually what it's called. That's what you would grab onto to move things. So I'm gonna move the abstract first because A comes before B and move that there. And then I have accruals, which would come between. So you could just move things around up or down as you see fit. Um, let's see what else, something that everybody uses. Conditions governing use, we'll use that. I'm not going to alphabetize everything, but I did want to bring some things up that weren't already up. So I have some preferences. If I just close this now without saving it, obviously it'll all go away. So you have a save preferences here, you have a save up here, and you'll have a save all the way, no you don't, at the bottom. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and save preferences. And then we did note order, so let's go to the search and browse column preferences. These, um, are relatively new. Um, some of them had already been in in earlier versions, um, but then they just threw in the kitchen sink. So now you have browsers for almost everything. Well, anything that you could do a browse search on is listed here. So you got a sessions, agents, archival objects, uh, assessment, background jobs, classification browse, etc. And let's go ahead and do a browse search before we go messing around with this so you can see what I'm talking about. So let's do a browse for resources. And you'll see that uh, there are one, two, three, four, there are five columns. They are listed in alphabetical order by title. Um, even if I couldn't see that up here, it says sort by title ascending. So it kind of gives you a clue. So let's go back to repository preferences. And we're gonna actually adjust the browse column for resource records. So let's go here to resource browse columns. So it has these defaults and if you loved those defaults, you could keep them. But if you want to rearrange the order, um, you could also do that. So I'm going to put the identifier first. Um, and then I'm going to put the title second. And then I like to have the EAD display just because. And then I want to know whether or not the record was published, has been marked for published or not. So that's in here right there. And then let's go ahead and keep this default of extent, but let's add, see it says no, column number six, no value, which means there's not a column six. 
I'm going to go ahead and add a column six on. I want the modified date to show up. And then you have this default sort column and default sort direction. Currently, it's title and it's ascending. So I'm going to leave that and go ahead and click on Save Preferences. <clears throat> and let's go back and browse the resources. So now I have the identifier first, the title, the EAD ID, published, extent, and modified. So an extra column. Um, if you were working on a laptop with a very tiny screen, you're probably not going to want all the columns that you possibly could have. The other thing to note is if you actually use this download CSV option, these are the fields and the order that it will display in the CSV that you download. Now let's go back and change the sort order just because we can. So if you do resource browse column, so default sort column is title. I'm going to leave it as title, but instead of ascending, I'm going to make it descending. Um, I'm going to leave it title, but all the choices that you had in your columns, you also have um, in your default sort columns. So let's save preferences and then do a browse resources. And now it's in reverse order. Another thing I wanted to show you was, let's go to browse accessions. This sort order also affects the type of head searches within the record. So if we go into a, a session record and let's go to add another resource, a related resource. Um, if I type in PA, so you notice W, S, and K. So it's sorting in reverse alphabetical order, just like I set the repository to search. So keep that in mind when you start getting wonky results that you might want to go into the uh, settings. And again, remember that um, the user settings override the repository settings. So it might be an individual change something. Um, and you'll have to go into their um, set up and figure out what they've done. Um, so let's say we don't we don't like what we did. Um, you could reset it to the factory defaults by just clicking on the reset defaults button here. But I do want to go back down to the notes and show you that how to um, actually apply those. And oh, there, we'll put that there. And that should do it. We'll do save preferences. So let's go to an actual record, the Krispy Kreme one. I know you guys have all been dying to get to that one. Krispy Kreme. And then we go down to notes. And you have to open them because there's lots. So you'll see the abstract, preferred citation, custodial history, processing information. The conditions governing access and governing use notes are at the bottom. If I want them to be in the order that I prescribed in the repository preferences, I could click here where it says apply standard note order or down here, depending on where I am in the record. And you notice that the order changed and now the governing access and governing use are higher up in the record. If I add a note, then it's always going to be at the bottom of the record. And I would have to click on apply standard order, standard note order to get it to move to its appropriate field. So um, it's not it's not every single time that it puts it in the order. So. So that's that. Let's go and revert our changes because we don't really want to save those. Um, and I'm a little ahead of the game. Yay! Any questions on that so far? No questions in the Q&A, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in anytime they come to you or now. <laughs> 
All right, now we're going to do some default values from the template, which that information is found on page 13 of your million page notebook if you wanted to scroll down there. Um, and I am so that I don't remember. Oh, okay, so users can set default values throughout the application. Default values are typically set when the value of a field is very frequently the same across records. For instance, a segment of the identifier in an accession or a resource record might indicate the custodial repository. If the repository identifier is set as a default value for a segment of the accession or resource identifier, then the identifier will be populated with that segment whenever a new accession or resource record is created. So in short, setting default values for repetitive data values is a good way for repositories to streamline data input. In addition, we use them in our repository on resource records for uh, notes that will stay the same across. It's, it, most of them are going to say, you know, this this collection is open or whatever. Um, and then the few times that they aren't, then we could change the note. It's not like it's stuck there forever. And the other thing we use it for is um, we have a lot of students and as a reminder that they have to put in a note. So we'll put in a blank abstract note, for example, because we require an abstract in all of our records. And so because it's blank, when a user tries to save that record, they'll get that lovely pink, there's an error message and they'll go, oh yeah, I have to go add a abstract. So let's go and set some default values. So first you need to go into your preferences again. <clears throat> and you need to click on pre-populate records and then save. And let's do a browse on resources. Well, let's do a browse on accessions. You can edit default values and have um, uh, default values for any new accession records you create. So if you open this, it looks just like an accession record. And I could fill out the fields that are going to be common across all of them. Um, for example, the I could put YNHSC as the first part of the identifier because for if that's what is always the first part of the identifier. If you're doing identifiers based on more like a session years, you could go in here every year on January 1st and change it from 2021 to 2022, for example. The others, the other things that have it, let's say digital objects have default values. Um, but not only do they have a digital object default value, you could have default values for the component record itself. So we'll click on that and it looks just like a component record and I could have a default value for the label if I want. And what we're actually going to fill out is a resource one, um, but just like the default values for the digital objects, the default values for resource records include the resource or the resource component. I'm going to click on resource. And uh, we're going to do for the level of description, we're going to always make that collection. And for the language of the um, thing, we're going to make this English. And for the script, we're going to make that Latin. And for the extents, we'll leave that as whole. Down here in the finding aid data, for the description rules, we always use DAX, for example. So we'll make that DAX. The language of description here which is a required field, we'll make that English. And then for the script, we'll make that Latin. And then, like I said, we're gonna go down here to notes and we're gonna click on add a note. And I'm just gonna do abstract. So somebody's forced to put in an abstract note. I'll add another note that's conditions governing access that says, oh, free, it's yours, free. 
And anything else that you can think of that is going to be common to all sorts of records. So I've filled it all out. I'm going to go ahead and click on save resource, even though it's not really a resource, it's just the default values. So now if I click on create a resource record from scratch, you'll see that the collections already filled out. English and Latin are there. It says whole here and it has DAX, English and Latin. And it has these notes already. So the conditions governing access note is already filled out, but the abstract note is just blank. You're gonna actually have to click on add content item to put in an abstract note, which, you know, just put that in your students' instructions. It's not too hard. <laughs> so that's how to fill out a template. The thing about templates is, for example, this is a resource record template. It will only populate if you create a new resource record from scratch. If you are spawning this from an accession record, none of these default defaults will actually fill in on the record. So let's go and get right out of here. Yes, I want to leave that page browse sessions. We only have the one accession record. So if I go here to view and do spawn a resource record, doo, 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 doo. it does have collection, but that came over from the accession record. You'll notice it does not have the language of the script or, or anything of that nature filled out. The finding aid data is not filled out. So that is how you could use the default values to improve efficiency and or to remind your students to put in some notes, um, that sort of thing. Any questions about populating records? Nothing in the Q&A right cool. now. Um, if anyone has a question and you're typing it, feel free to also, to, you can always raise your hand um, and that can alert me to pause and slow down a little bit. But as of right now, no question. Oh, we have a question. <laughs> <laughs> See, if I talk long enough, someone will ask a question. Can a default record slash component be created for a collection or does it have to be for all of your records? So you just want to use it on one collection? Um, no, it applies actually to all your records and to all your users. So if you put in a default template, you know, and you call it and, and you're just hoping it applies to your collections, everybody else in your institution will be seeing that and applying that template also. So you only get one template per repository, I suppose. Right, so that template would apply at the repository level. So if you only have one repository within your implementation of archive space, that would apply to everyone. But maybe you have several different departments and they each have their own repository. They could each have their own default values. So each yes. repository could have their own. Yes, unless of course you set it up as a global, but yeah, yeah. Um, we're gonna move on to the controlled value lists. And that's on page 16. The controlled valued lists can only be accessed by system administrators. Um, and they're coincidentally enough under the system menu. They, you would click on system and manage controlled value lists. So these are the terms and phrases that are listed throughout the program in the drop down boxes. Um, so anywhere there's a drop down box, it shows up in here. There are two types of controlled valued lists. There's the configurable ones where you could actually de delete headings and add headings and merge headings. And then there's system supplied ones that are usually based on NISO standards um, of some sort. And so they don't want you just adding made up languages willy nilly, for example. Um, 
at which I know some people want to make up languages willy nilly, or they say, oh, the system doesn't, isn't it updated as frequently as this particular list, but you're just going to have to live with it. <laughs> I think it's easier to have one person maintain some of these than it is for everybody to go out on their own. I like a big Wild West show. So let's look at a configurable list, which is the instance type. So the names are in alphabetical order and that usually starts if it's if it's only pertains to a particular type of record it will start with that record type so a session acquisition type and then in sessions the parts relator a session resource type a session and then these are agents dates of course are everywhere so that's just under dates so it's kind of like you probably just need to explore the list to figure out where the thing you're worried about is contained. And I want instance, instance type, because that's in the instance record and it's instance type. So you could tell that this is a configurable list because it has this lovely create value button and it has way more colors down here <laughs> than in a non-configurable list. So let's go to a non-configurable list. That would be the language, which is based on an ISO standard. And I went too far. And that one. Dun, dun, dun. And it takes so long because it's populating these fields, which we'll get to. So you'll notice it does not have the create button. And it doesn't have pretty colors. It just has this one brown that says suppress. Um, if you're in a non-configurable list, you can still hide things so that they don't show up in the drop-down list. Because as you can see, this language list goes on for miles. And who knows, maybe you're never going to use a FAR. So why should I have to see it in the list? So you can suppress these so that they don't show up in the list. So I will suppress a far and I will suppress um, whatever. <laughs> and so oh, it takes so long because you know there's a lot of people. So these two are suppressed. And so if we went into a language list and just opened it up, you wouldn't see these listed. However, let's go down to, I'm gonna do control F for English, E-N-G-L-I-S-H, and go down to English. You'll notice that there are seven items in this instance that are using the language code English. And suppress is not the muddy brown, it's a lighter brown because I can't suppress it. You cannot suppress a value if it is actually used. But never fear, if you want English to always appear first, for example, notice it's down at least 122 uh, spots from the top. But if you want it to appear first and you have a lot of time, you can click on this up arrow and it will move it up to number 121. So let me do control F and we will do English again. And do, do, do. so now it's number 121. So you can move these things around some. It would be nice if they had the hamburger, but they don't, but at least you can move them. So for non-configurable lists, you can suppress. You can move them around or, um, and this is true for any kind of list, you could set it as a default. So remember um, for finding a data section now on resource records, it's required that you have the language and script. And for us, because our finding aids are always going to be written in English, I'm gonna go ahead and set the default as English Dun, dun, dun. So when I do this, let me go ahead and go up here to repository preferences. And I'm going to turn off that pre-populate records and save it. So now when I create 
a new resource record, it's not going to pre-populate with those template values that I put in. But if I click on Create Resource, it should, ah, it did not. It was supposed to put in the language of description here because I've made it the default. <sighs> Demos, you know. <laughs> In theory, it was supposed to show up there, but let's do manage controlled values and go to a configurable list. Um, we'll go to the container types. So container type. So this is a configurable list. It says create values, has multiple colors, handy dandy listing of how many records we have 21 that have folder you could actually click on this and get to a listing of everything that uses folder as a container type which is kind of nice and we'll go back here the other thing you can do in a configurable list so we have down here, we have flat file and we have flat file. We only want one of them. We don't need two of them. Um, you'll notice up here with box, you have the value and you have the translation. The value has a little b and the translation has a capital B. Whereas down here in flat file, we have either a capital F or we have a lowercase f in both places. That's because this one was system supplied and the flat file was added later using the create value. When you create a value, then uh, you only get to fill out one of these. Uh, let's go ahead and delete a value first. Again, uh, just like suppressing, you can't delete something if it's used, which is why being able to click on here is handy because then you could go and find those records if you need to. Flat file with capital Fs is not used, so I could just delete it by clicking on the delete button. It asks if you're really, really sure, which is always a good thing, and you would click on delete value. Oh, it's, it is not, it says it's not used. Cancel. Let's try this one. Dun, 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 dun. It's still used too. Oh, trust me, on your interface, if it says it's not used, then you should be able to delete it. Malaka, um, yes. So what it may be that uh, it's not used in your specific repository, but it's used within another repository. So oh, that's right. See, I like my repository. We just have the one. Have the one, yeah. <laughs> if you use multiple repositories and another repository, so another department within your library is using that value, it will it will not be indicated that it's used within your repository because you don't have access to those records, but it is being used there. So if you ever get that kind of error, odds are someone else has decided to use that value and you probably Hopefully, if you are an institution with multiple repositories, you have some sort of implementation team where a representative, oh my gosh, Natalie Adams, we have 33 repositories. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. So Natalie, I hope that you have some sort of implementation task force where someone representing each repository, you all meet and talk about these sorts of things. Just me looking after them. Okay, Natalie, bless oh, you. Wow. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so if it says not used, but it's giving you an error that it is used, that means it's someone else in another else's repository. Yeah. We're going to create a new value by clicking on create value. And you see, you only get the choice to put in value. So it's up to you whether you want to create these with all lowercase or camel case. I'm going to use camel case, I guess. Why not? And I'm just going to put volume and create the value. And I know this one isn't used, so I go ahead and delete it right quick. Ta-da, and it's really deleted. Um, the other thing you could do is merge values. So for example, I have box with a little b, and I have box with both of them as capital Bs. 
even though this one is used more often than the system supplied one, I'm going to merge the this one into the system supplied one. So what I need to do is click on the merge button next to the one I don't want to keep. And then I choose what value to merge it into, um, which is that one um, of the one I do want to keep. So you click on merge value. And box disappeared. It does still say only two related items, but that's because it needs to be re-indexed, which may or may not take a few minutes. Um, and I could click on something else and then come back. Let's do sessions. And then we could go back to container types. Ah, still not. Trust me. When it gets re-indexed, this will have 46 related items instead of just the two <clears throat> that oh, were there so before. Malaka, let me just say that Malaka has been saying a lot of just trust me because we're running so many workshops and you all have your own individual instances. We're currently running 150 different archive spaces right now. So things are very slow on the back end, um, but she's right. Eventually the back end will catch up. <laughs> It does. See? 46 related items. Ta-da. All right. Now, this is another drop-down list that if you want, for example, the reels to be higher up than they currently are, all you have to do is click on the up arrow. And it moved it up by one. And then you could click on it. You can click on the down arrow to move it down by one. You'll notice that the first position starts with zero because it's a computer and computers start counting at zero. Um, so keep that in mind when you go, oh, there's only 10. Well, always add one. There's 11 values because zero counts as one. All right. We are ready for our first exercise, which is on page 24 of your um manual and you could go ahead and work on that and then take a 10 minute break um so the next thing we're going to cover is being able to bulk load component records there are a few different ways to do that in archive space um, obviously, you could do it one at a time, and you could go add child or add sibling, um, which is not doing it in bulk, obviously, but, you know, it, it, it's more intuitive for some people. There's the rapid data entry tool, which we're going to cover next. Um, my experience with the rapid data entry tool is either you love it or you hate it. Um, you can merge resource records to get the components on there. For example, um, let's say you have like a bare bones. Well, you have the resource record is in there perfectly, but it has no containers, but you have your containers in an EAD record, for, uh, for example. Um, you could import that D EAD and merge the records and have containers added that way, which I'll show you how to do. Um, or there's the infamous, used to be called Harvard plugin, but now it's just load via spreadsheet because it's been added to the um, actual archive space um, parent code so that everybody could use it. Um, and what I'm going to cover right now is the rapid data entry, which is on page 25 of your workbook if you want to sort of follow along. I'm going to create a new record, um, a resource record. Yeah, mine is slow too because it's on a test instance. <laughs> but <clears throat> and the title is going to be gambling, G A M B L I N G. And it's a the identifier, we're just going to make it one, two, three, four, five. Languages are filled in because I have mine set as default. The dates, we will make the dates. Oh, anything we want. Let's do 1990 to 2000. 
and 20. And we will make this inclusive dates. The number, oh, let's go with five. And we'll do dun, dun, linear feet. And this stuff is filled out with the default information, so I don't have to worry about it. And I'm going to go ahead and because mine is set up with default notes, I'm just going to delete all these notes so I don't have to worry about them. And we will save the resource record. So now we have a resource record for gambling. Um, I can add series to this by clicking on add child or well, let's go ahead and add a child. So we'll do it one at a time and we'll make the title poker and we'll save that. Now, as those who gamble know, there are many, many variations of poker. So we're going to put one game of poker in each folder. So instead of adding a whole bunch of children to this series heading, well, actually, I better make that a series heading. Otherwise, people get confused. Um, we're going to use rapid data entry to add some um, files under here. So you obviously have to be in edit mode. Um, and then you click on rapid data entry. And you get this lovely, long, scrolly thing. So it only, when you first start, it only lists one record. It scrolls all the way over. Um, so, and it's pretty long. It's broken up into sections kind of visually so that you, if you think about the record, you go, oh yeah, there's the information that's at the top. There's the language, there's the date, extent, information about the container and the instances and all the different child types. You could also add notes from here if you want. So it's all there. Um, if you see the blue, that's called sticky. So if I type something in one of these blue columns and then add another row, Whatever I typed in that sticky column will replicate into the next new row that I create. You could turn off script sticky stuff by clicking on it so that the blue goes away. Um, up here it says how many columns are visible. Right now there's 33. If I don't want to see a column because I'm not going to use it, I can hide it by clicking on here and going, well, I'm not going to use other level. So let's get rid of that. Um, I'm not going to use publish because it won't be published until it's over. So I don't need to see the publish information. Thank goodness for uh, on archival objects, the language and the script are not required. So I don't need to see those. I might put in a date, so I'll leave that. I'm not going to put extent on an archival object record, so let's get rid of that. And, and then I click anywhere to get out of it, and now it says there's only 23 visible. So that's how you know how many columns you have. You just have to know how many were the default. Um, Let's do a level of description. We're going to make this a file. And well, actually, we're going to make this a series. We're going to make this a series. If I want to do series, I need to be at the series level on the original record. But if you can't remember where you were on the original record, you could always click on cancel, which is what I'm going to do. OK, so right now I'm at poker. So if I do rapid data entry, it's going to add stuff as children under poker. But if I want to add series under gambling, I would have that record open and do rapid data entry. And you'll see, because I'm still in 
archive space. I haven't like closed it totally. Any modifications I've made to RDE, which is short for uh, rapid data entry, stays. So I still only have 23 visible columns. So I'm going to go ahead and change this to series and leave that sticky. Actually, oh, you can. It used to be you couldn't make that unsticky, but it is sticky because I'm going to make a whole bunch of different series. Um, and for title, I'm going to have slot machines. And that's all I really need for an archival object record. None of these other fields are required. So if I want to see if I have any errors, I would click on view inline errors and it would be pink. Well, we could do validate rows. And if it's green, you did everything correctly. If I wanna add more rows, you could click here and you could use these arrow keys to go up one number or down one number, or you could actually just erase that number one and change it to like a four so that there's five. Do, 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 do. And oh, really add row, add row, add row. Two more. Oh, it just won't do it in mine. So we'll just add a couple more rows. Okay, you see this obnoxious pink thing? To get rid of that, you click on view inline errors so that it goes away. Let's type in some more titles. Let's do roulette. You could do shift tab down without having to use your mouse to click all the time. And we'll do blackjack. And we'll do craps and we'll do Kino. And then I got this extra line here and it's like, oh, I don't want that one. I made too many. You could delete that by going all the way over here and clicking on this X and then clicking on it again. So you notice these are pink and you're like, but I thought I did it correctly. Well, it's just the view inline errors thing that never really works well. Click on validate rows and they're all green, so it's okay. So then you click on save rows and it's gonna add them to my record. So see, it added all of those to the record. Now we're gonna go to poker and add some poker games. So we'll click on rapid data entry here. For this one, we want this level of description to still be sticky, but we want it to be file. The component unique identifier we're not going to use. So in theory, I could hide that if I want it to be out of my way. But, but I do want to use the dates. And I'm going to do a single date for each of these. And the label is going to be create date for all of these. The begin and end are currently sticky, but since they're going to be different for each one, I'm going to make that unsticky. Instance type, I'm going to make that mixed materials for each one. And then top container. These are all going to be in box one, which doesn't exist yet. So I can create it by clicking on create and then putting in the indicator of one and the container type of box and then create and link top container. So it's a box one. If you already had a box that you wanted to create to connect it to, you would have just typed in this box that using the type ahead and then chosen the box the, that you wanted to use. So then the child type, I want that to be sticky. So I, I turn it blue because I want all of them to be folders. And that's all the information I'm going to include in all of my records. I'm going to get rid of this view inline errors again. And let's do four rows, add rows. So 
it did file all the way down, single all the way down, creation, etc., all the way down. So that's very helpful. But, and my titles are all going to be different. So let's go ahead and type those in. Um, let's see, we got Texas Hold'em. Everybody knows Texas Hold'em. And then we have seven card stud. And we have five card stud. Um, we got jacks are better to open, right? And we have Omaha. So those are some nifty poker games. But for the dates, I want them to start at 1990, and then this would be 1991, 92, 93, 94. So I could fill them in manually, or we could use this fill column um, feature, which opens up this box at the top. Um, we're going to skip this basic for now, and we're going to go to sequence. For sequence, we're going to pick that we want the dates information. So the date begin information, we want it to be in a sequence that starts at 1990 and goes to how many did I have? 91, 2, 3, 4, so till 1994. Now you could preview this sequence just in case. Um, you could also add a prefix or a suffix to it if you wanted to, um, but be aware that spacing matters. So um, if I had a suffix that I put here, like, I don't know, ta-da. If I typed it just like that and I previewed it, then it's gonna be squished together. So if I actually want a space between the ending date and the ta-da, I have to put a space. I'm not actually going to put a prefix or a suffix on this. I click on apply sequence. And then we got 1990 through 1994 filled in for us. Woohoo! Um, mixed materials, child indicator. So, the child indicator is also going to be in sequence from one to um, however many. So let's go back here to fill column and go down here to child indicator. And let's do this with a fill value of, for the prefix, we're going to put over size and then put a space. And then we'll do numbers one through five, and then you preview the sequence, and that's what it'll look like, which looks good to me. So I'm going to go ahead and click on apply sequence. <clears throat> so we got oversize one, two, three, four, five. Now let's say I really did have a grandchild type that I wanted to add, and that it would have been the same for all of them. And I don't want to have to go in and change all these to item. You can go in to this fill column and go back to this basic um, tab and I'll pick the column. So let's pick the column of doo -doo -doo, grandchild type. And then we want that fill value. Since the grandchild type is, um, it comes from a drop down list it's going to supply the drop down list. If it was a free text field, you wouldn't have this drop down arrow. So we're going to put in item and we'll put in apply field, fill. <laughs> and so now all the grandchild types are item. And let's say I want all the grandchilds to be um, the indicator. I'm gonna, so this is a free text field. So I'm gonna put the indicator is one on all of them also. Dun, dun, dun. So that's all filled in. We're gonna validate the rows to make sure that we didn't leave any required information out, which we did not. So then I save the rows. 
And ta-da, now we have poker games. The other thing you can do with rapid data entry is reorder the columns. So for example, if I want the child indicator to be all the way at the front, I just click on that a million times and apply column order. And now the child indicator is at the front, which I find helpful because then I can remember what folder number I'm on. Um, if you have a template, well, if you've messed with this and put things in all the orders you want and made your labels and your dates and all your required fields exactly how you want and you know you're going to use that on another record and another record and another record, you could save that format as a template. So you would type in a template name here. Um, I'm going to type in test and we'll say save template. And then when I come cancel, and let's go here. And if I go up to rapid data entry, I can then um, apply the template. So I had that test. Let's actually do this one, the folder date one that I have. And so see files already set, mixed materials is already set, it already says folder there. And that's all, so we've shortened the scroll bar. So there's not as many things available for the student to get confused with. These are the only fields they need to fill in. And they use that template and then they would validate the rows and add that information. So that's how you do rapid data entry. I hope I wasn't too rapid for you. And I actually have a, a set of exercises for you. And I'm trying to remember what page that's on. In your workbook on page, oh my goodness, it goes forever, doesn't it? Ah, there we go, page 38 is homework that you could do, um, exercise that you could do. I'll give you, I don't know, five minutes, Jessica. Five minutes sounds fine. Um, uh, everyone should be up and running right now. Uh, your, it, your instance may go down again because um, so many people are using them. Uh, just let me know and bear with us. Uh, after this workshop is over, overnight, we're going to uh, basically make them bigger, resize them so that they won't do this when you're playing over the next two days. But uh, something weird and random may happen in the next hour and a half. But after that, we'll make sure that they're working for you. So just bear with us in that regard. But yeah, five minutes for that. And then we do have a question in the chat, uh, Malaka. Just let okay. me know. You, you want to go ahead and do questions now? Sure. Yeah. And it's a good question. Now, so Natalie asked, um, in the beginning, you uh, did your date, you use the date expression instead of the begin and end dates. Yes, because uh, I'm lazy. It's a lot better to use begin and end. So could you maybe explain the difference? Um, yes, so uh, normally at KU, we actually have a policy of using the begin and end dates um, rather than the expression um, or in addition to the expression, um, because if you use a big, if you use the actual begin and end date fields here, these are normalized dates, and computer programs will be able to search them. And if you actually use, for example, the archive space public user interface, and you filter by date and say I want everything 1975, it will be able to find this record because I put 1975 in here, for example. If it's just an expression. Um, computers aren't able to actually use the date filters for that sort of thing. And here at KU, we use the begin and end dates um, and we'll use obviously the expression if we have to put approximately or between. Um, and we also will use the expression if we have the month and day because a lot of people can't quickly go, oh, the third month is March. So this way they could just look at it and goes March 3rd, 1922. All right. Um, hopefully everyone's kind of starting to work on their um, 
their exercise, but did you, um, we are only at, it's 126 your time, Malaka. So about how much longer do you need? For the exercises? If everyone's gonna do an exercise. Um, let's go till 1.30 and then we'll come back and see if anybody has questions about their exercises. And then I'm gonna show them how to import uh, E80. Okay, that's no time at all. So just go ahead and play around with it and see if you have any questions. If you have questions about RDE, type it into the chat. Someone did say in the chat that they love the rapid data entry tool, which is a very see? strong statement. Um. <laughs> I know, they're, they're, you either love it or you hate it. There's no in between. <laughs> That's, that's really true. Um, so if you have questions about using RDE or, or ways that that might work for you, feel free to type them into the chat too. But hopefully everybody's playing around with their um, instances and, and testing. Uh, one note about the templates, and you may have said it, Malaka, so I apologize if you did. Um, unlike some of the other things we've talked about so far, the templates are not repository specific, meaning that everyone can see your template. So it's not just you specific or repository specific. So um, you may want to take that into consideration. So if you have some sort of minimal template that you want to use and pull out, and someone else may have a, another minimal template that they want to use, make sure that you label them appropriately so that you know that, oh, this is Jessica's, not Malaka's. Or if you have a template that you only use for your student workers, make sure you put, this is the rare book student worker template or something like that. Yeah. And one of the reasons that people sometimes hate the RDE is when it becomes upgrade time, that's one of the templates, especially are things you might need to go back and reset up, um, especially if they've added fields like language <laughs> um, that wasn't included last time, or um, sometimes it just, it's, it's just glitchy. And I, I find it just easier to, to wipe them out and start all over. <clears throat> All right. So does anybody have any questions about the exercise they wanted me to go back and cover? There probably wasn't a lot of time to do that, but you of course can go back and do it on your own some more. And I just randomly picked Denzel because I just finished watching that movie that came out not too long ago with him in it. Yes, a real movie. Granted it was on my TV, but it was HBO Max. <laughs> Okay, so another way to get um, containers on there uh, without actually having to type them in manually or use RDE is to merge two resource records. If especially you have legacy finding aids in EAD um, that uh, you're tweaking anyway, what you could do is go in here and let's create another resource record. This one's also fake. Um, oh gosh, I hope I took out the, we'll have to see. Um, let's call it fake record. And the identifier will be uh, 9876. And the dates here will be um, today and the type will be single. But obviously you'll have sweated all over this. It'll have a numerous amounts of notes that are beautiful that you want to use. Um, so, but it has no containers. So you want to, oh gosh, I forgot about the stupid notes thing. <laughs> Expand. Delete, remove, delete, remove, delete, remove, delete, remove, and delete, remove, save. Okay, so I have an EAD that um, I, um, what do you call? Oh, I hate that thing. Um, downloaded from our system that looks like this and um 
I'm going to have to go in and tweak something here because uh, since I'm in my system, it's not going to like it. It'll say there's a duplicate. <laughs> so we will call this, um, oh, I don't know, TES1. And we'll get rid of that. That should do it for unique identifiers. So I have an EID. It doesn't have a lot of information at the top because when you merge EADs, it's going to only keep the information in the resource record that um, you perform the merge on. So this is the one that I'm going to merge into the existing record. So all I really need is all of these books and stuff that I don't want to have to type again because I already have it in EAD. So why do I need to type it again, correct? So let's go down here. So what I want to do is um, import a record. So I can create a background job and import data. And then I want to, since it's an EAD, I will change this to EAD. Obviously, if you have CSVs um, for digital object or something, you could do this same sort of technique. And then I'm going to drag and drop that here and cross my fingers. Start the job. The job's next in the queue. And so far it's running ish. Yay. Oh, that didn't work because it's already matched one. Um, let's go in and just merge two because again, these are my, this is my test instance, so it doesn't really matter. Oh, come on. Um, this one. So I have this record and let's say I imported another record that had, um, a bunch of objects on it that I wanted to merge with this. Um, so all I would have to do would be at the collection level, there's this merge button. I click on merge and I would do, let's do the Harper papers, no, really. Um, oh, Tim Miller, he's good too. You know, it's Francis. We have too many things and it just doesn't search well. Francis Harper papers. So if I click on merge after searching and finding the one I wanted, it says, are you really, really sure? And I say, yeah, sure, why not? And again, because I'm on a slow thing. So now I have all of these series that weren't there before because those came over from my Francis Harper papers, um, which for the longest time I thought was a dude, but no, I mean a girl, but it's a dude. Um, and so those have come over. So if you have something, if you have two resource records that you want to merge, be aware that the record you have where you click on the merge button, that resource record is the one that's being retained. Anything in the resource part of the record that you're merging is a total goner, um, but it will bring over all those component records and it will put it after any existing component records you already have. Any questions about that? All right, now we're going to import archival objects from Excel. Um, let me see if I can actually access the test instance because it'll work better there because I have the, <laughs> the yeah, yeah, Malaka, your workshop should work. We will see. Okay, cool. So I will get rid of that and move this over. Okay. So the importing archival objects from Excel in your workbook is on page 40 if you really want to scroll down that far. 
Um, there's a lot of information. In the Google Docs page that you were given in the chat, there should be um, an Excel document called bulk import template.xlssx. Please go ahead and download that. Um, there is exercise three, we're going to just do that together. <laughs> so everybody should download that Excel file. And this is what it looks like when you open it up. Okay, so we want to add um, containers to the fly fishing guy, Horcrux, Jedediah, that's his name. So if you open up your Jedediah Horcrux record in edit mode, you'll see a load via spreadsheet button. Um, in the workbook, and if you click on this help and go to where it talks about load via spreadsheet, there are multiple documents on the GitHub site. Two of them are CSVs um, and two of them are Excel. Um, one is for just loading digital objects onto a resource record. So this isn't putting digital objects into the digital objects. It's still attaching them to the resource records. Um, and the other one is uh, adding resource records and if you want, um, digital objects to the resource record. And so the one I have in your Google Drive is the bulk import template, which is the um, one that does resource records resource component records, and if you desire digital objects all at the same time. Um, so you've downloaded this. I would recommend saving this as your master copy. So what we're going to do is do a save as. And you could call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it Horcrux 2 because I already have one <laughs> and save that in there. And so now you should be in Horcrux 2 and you will have, you will retain the bulk import template.xlsx for using again and again and again. Um, it will happen. Somebody's not going to do a save as, and you'll have to download a new copy. It's fine. Just make sure you know where the link is <laughs> or save multiple copies all over the place. Um, let's see. We're going to go. So the homework assignment is on page 54 for those who want to follow along. So the things in red here are required. Some are required ifs um, and some are just required required. Um, all the fields that are normally required in an archival object record are also required. Um, so for example, if you put in dates, then you have to put in the date type. Um, so it, it does require that you know a little bit about archive space, um, or you write really good documentation for your students who don't know anything about archive space. Um, you can hide columns that you're not going to use. For example, I'm certainly not going to mess with this language information again. So I could hide all three of those by clicking there and doing hide. Um, and that makes it a little shorter. And they have information up here in little bitty font <laughs> that you could read that gives you some examples of data that you might want to put that, that goes into these kind of fields. So kind of helpful hints. Um, we're going to go ahead and 
fill out the EAD ID portion of this. So we're gonna, just like the rapid data entry, I'm gonna fill out the first row and then we'll come back and fill out the rest of the rows um, because you can take advantage of Excel and use the copy paste features or the, you know, pull it down so that it adds numbers for you feature kind of thing, um, which is why everybody wanted to use Excel as a container creation tool because it's just so much faster and easier. So the EAD for this EAD ID for this collection is MS 293.xml. Um, if you do not have an EAD ID, then you have to have the resource URI. You might ask, what is the resource URI? That would be this thing up here. Um, so that would need to be included in all the rows so that it knows what record to match up with. Um, but since this record actually has in the finding aid data section an EAD ID, which is way shorter, that's why I'm using an EAD ID field here. So I'll leave the resource URI blank. The title of the first record is going to be a subseries. Um, is going to be dry flies, D-R-Y-F-L-I-E-S. Yes, it's going to be fishing. Um, component unique identifier is not required. I'm not gonna use it, so I'm gonna leave it alone. Hierarchical relationship. These are the numbers one through et cetera, one, two, three, four, five, and it will make a difference where you are in the resource record when you load the spreadsheet. So I want my information to be series. Um, and so they're going to be a subseries under photographs because these are going to be, they're going to be pictures <laughs> of flies that you use when fly fishing. So under photographs, so under the series photographs, which yes, it says file, but I didn't make this record. Pretend it's a series. So under here, we're going to have subseries and we're going to have files. So if this is where I'm at when I click on load via spreadsheet, if I use the number one in the hierarchical relationship, it will create a sibling. If I use the number two, when I click on load via spreadsheet in hierarchical relationship, then it will create the subseries. And then the three would create a file and a four would create an item, et cetera. I mean, obviously I would have to label it that, but think of it that way. So here, since I'm planning to have the photographs archival object open, and I want it to be a subseries under photographs, I'm gonna put the number two. And then the description level is required. And it's a drop down list. Um, and the makers of this spreadsheet were helpful and populated it for you. So I could go ahead and just click on subseries here. Other level is not required, publish is not required. And if you don't fill it out, I believe. Um, I think it'll just be false, but I'm going to go ahead and say it's true. So you got false or true. So I'm going to pick true. I don't have any restrictions or processing notes and the language stuff needs to go away. Um, dun, 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 dun. We'll hide that some more. And dates, I'm not putting in dates, so I could either hide it or scroll through it. But obviously, if you use the dates, then again, the date label would be required, the date type is required, and you know, either begin and end or expression, depending on what you're doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide the dates. Hide, hide, hide. The extent information, if you want to put in extent information, um, 
just like in archive space itself, you would have to have the extent number and the type if you're going to use those. I'm not going to use those. So again, I'm going to hide those. And let's hide that some more. And but over here, the container information I am going to fill out. So container instance type, it's not a drop down. This information comes from the controlled value list. So remember there was a value and there was a translation. And some things were uppercase and some things were lowercase. The things that were supplied by default don't even have spaces, they all have underscores. So um, if you don't know for sure what your container type should be, um, I recommend going to the controlled value list and finding out for sure what it is um, so you don't get any errors when importing. In this case, it's going to be a graphic and then an underscore materials. And that's what it is in the controlled value list. So the top container here, in this particular record that we're going to be attaching things to, they already have a box one through four. Um, so we're gonna make this a box, um, B-O-X with a little B, because that's again, what is in the value of in the controlled value list, especially now that I merged them. So there's no capital one <laughs> left. Um, so the container indicator number is gonna be five. I'm not gonna have a barcode. The child type, this one isn't going to have, wait a minute, I'm sorry. We're doing a series, so it doesn't have this information, but I'm gonna leave it there and move it down one. So control X, control V. Okay, so since it's a series, all I need is the EAD ID, the dry flies, the hierarchical relationship of two and the subseries, and I want it published. Underneath that is where I want the files. And so there's gonna be an Adams fly, there's gonna be an army ant fly, and a blue quill fly. Now these are all gonna be files, so they'll be threes. And then here, they'll be files. Now I could do the drop down thing over and over, or I could just do control C and control V. The lazy man's way. So that's file. And again, this is gonna be true. And we'll go down and do true. And these three are all going to be in that box five. So I could just copy paste that. The child type will be folder, folder on all three. And the child indicators will be one, two, three. So I could do folder here and copy down. And then here I could do the draggy thing where it just does one, two, three. And now I want another series, sub-series. This one's gonna be the nymph flies. So this will be a three. No, this will be a two because it's back to being a sub-series. This will be true. See, I know. True. This will be blank. Those will be blank. But then we have whew, hairs, ear, barbless, which is good because I always manage to get stuck. And that one is a file, so that's a three. And Al's rat is file. And then another series, which would be the streamers. So that'll be a two. And we got the bee monkey 
gray and a black ghost. And so those would be threes, threes. This is a subseries. And this will be a file, which I'm going to copy all the way down. And yes, then I could go back here to this one and change that one to a subseries since everything else. And this is true. And then I'm copying this information all the way down and then I will delete it from the ones that it doesn't need to be on, which would be that one, that one, that one, and that one, and that one, that one, that one, that one. And so then this will be four, this will be five, this will be six, and this will be seven. Okay, so if all I wanted to do was create archival objects, I'm done. But I actually have URLs to digital objects for this, these items. So um, if you have that, you can copy and paste that information from your workbook or just make up your own or just watch and see the magic um, because you know URLs are not something that's easy to type correctly the first time. So I'm going to just copy and paste it from here. Um, so I got this is the digital object section, the blue section, um, and I have the URL of the items. So there they go. So digital object ID, you would leave this blank. Okay, so I don't already have archival objects and I want them to use the same title for the digital objects as we're using for the archival objects. So I would leave the digital object title blank. Um, and I obviously they don't exist, so there's no ID. D, if I had thumbnail images, which we probably learned about yesterday from Aaron, um, you could put that in information in here, but I don't have thumbnails. I just have the links to the linked out objects. And so that's what's going in here. So now it's ready and I could save it. And close. And then remember, I'm going to put it at photograph. So I make sure that record's open and I click on load via spreadsheet. Um, recently, this, this past, well, not the one with the agents, but the one before that, they added a feature where if you wanted to just double check that your spreadsheet is okay to actually go in, that you haven't made any errors, you could click on only validate, load your spreadsheet. It wouldn't actually load the archives archival objects, but it would give you the error messages that um, that you would see if you'd done something wrong, which is very helpful on very long and filled out spreadsheets because it's like, oh, well, it added the first 50 and then it blew up. Great. Um, so you could do that. You could select a file by clicking here and going to the file and clicking on open, or you could actually, um, I believe, drag it in if you had if you had it handy in another window. So we're going to click on import from spreadsheet and see what happens. This job is next. Oh, I should have checked. There were errors. A whole bunch of errors. <sighs> what did I do? Well, I actually I know this one works, so we'll um, load this one. Dun, 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 dun. So let's go back to the resource record of Jedediah Horcrux. Edit. Click on photographs and resources. Oh, dang it. <laughs> 
photographs, load via spreadsheet, select file. It'll be that first one. Open and import from spreadsheet. This one will work. At least it did yesterday. <laughs> oh no. Oh, I know why. And I'm sure if we all had our volume on, you could tell me why. I didn't put the EID, EADID all the way down. So let's open the spreadsheet. And this is the part I didn't do. I only put it in once. So I need to copy that and put it all the way down. And let's save that. Now let's go back to the resource and edit that. So it did do the one graphic material. Load via spreadsheet, only validate this time, just in case. Select file, Horcrux, import from. <laughs> Does not match the EAD rows EAD ID. Really? <sighs> Resource. I'm sure it did. I copied and pasted in everything. So finding aid data, MS 292, Horcrux 2, oh, 293. Ha, that's why. B. Oh, cancel. And then we could do, oh, and copy. Ah, so that's why it was the wrong EAD ID. Sorry, this is taking so long, guys. But it's really cool when it works. Dismiss changes. Photographs. Load. Select file. Horcrux. Open. Import. And so now it's actually creating things, including a top container, it even says. And you could refresh the page. You get a report here of all your errors. And if it actually worked and it created things, you could um, just randomly click on one of these and actually get to it. So here's the army ant. And it has instances of both a, the box five and the digital object army ant. So folder two and the digital object, it did create this record. You could link to this record and view this record. Ta-da, as a digital object. And it has the file here that goes out to another website that you could look at and go, ooh, look, there's Army Ant. So that's snazzy. And that's how you use the Harvard template. Any questions on that? Nothing in the chat right now, but if you have questions about it, please go ahead and put them in. Um, I did include in, very cool, it is cool. Uh, it takes a couple, fails um, the first few times, but once you get it down, it is really cool and it's really useful. It's by far the it's most- very popular. fast. It's very fast. Um, it's great to use for like student workers or people who don't necessarily need to have access into all of archive space. It's a great tool. It's the most popular tool in archive space. I went ahead and linked um, to the GitHub that has all of the different templates. Um, and in case you want to use a different template. And then um, I will, I don't know if I dropped it in the chat or not, but I'll go ahead and do it again. Um, I'll drop a link to all of the migration tools and data maps for other things. Um, and 
So these templates are there, but there's other stuff there that you might want to use as well. And one other thing I did go ahead and drop into the um, into your Google Drive, I put a test uh, in, in, in addition to the template that was already in there that Malaka referenced and used today, I went ahead and put just a test um, a spreadsheet in there that already has some data in it that I know won't fail if you want it. So the data in there is, is good. Uh, if you want to use that to practice, um, it's one that you can use and you don't have to worry about actually filling out the spreadsheet and any errors like that. Uh, and then we have a question in the chat, Malaka. Is it possible to add extra columns to the spreadsheet? Like for example, subnotes. Um, it is possible to add um, like additional, in some cases, like the additional instances, but I don't know about subnotes if they're not already there, whether you could add it or not. Um, you could always try. Just make sure you give it a unique name. I think if you look through the um, instructions, they tell you how to add additional fields, for example, for, um, you know, grandchild, child, etc. additional instance records. Um, and there's some naming conventions they recommend there. So you could try that <clears throat> and see if that'll work. Yeah, you can always try anything. Um, <laughs> I, if, if you have access to the Archive Space Help Center, there is some really great documentation in the Help Center that was originally written by the person that wrote the Harvard plugin and wrote, uh, created the spreadsheet. So the documentation is really sound and has only been sort of built out. So if you are, um, if you do have Help Center access, I would definitely review that. It does a good job of telling you or giving you some clues about what you can and can't delete, can and can't hide that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, you can you can try anything. And um, when in doubt, or if you ever have issues, if you're an Archive Space member, always take it to the Archive Space listserv first, because everybody's using this spreadsheet and everybody has probably tried something uh, and knows it doesn't work or does work. All righty. Now on to agents and subject records, my favorites. Um, I was a formal, former authority maintenance unit supervisor. I'll share my screen again. All right. So agents and subject records, um, as you probably have discovered, uh, Archive Space has a default plugin, um, the LCNAF import. It has changed a little over time. Um, it used to also include uh, import from OCLC, but that one frequently was uh, garbled um, and, and most people prefer LC anyway. So um, that's what you've got now. Uh, let's go ahead and do a browse agents. And there's one for the supercomputer that I wanted to look at. The San Diego Supercomputer Center. It says here, NACO authority file. If you click on view, it will tell you what, if any records it's linked to. So it's linked to the Santa Fe light cone simula simulation research project files. However, it doesn't have any cross references. Um, and as a person uh, who does a lot of NACO records, I know that's probably wrong. Um, there's at least one um, cross reference and it's got a period here. It just drives me crazy. Um, <laughs> so there's probably a real NAF record. So even though the whoever created this set it up as NAF, it's not the actual NAF record. So let's go to uh, the LC NAF plugin and get the NAF record, um, which is much faster than typing in any cross references. Um, if it, of course, exists in LC NAF, a lot of our archives, um, of course, are about things that are unique to us and they don't have LC NAF records. Um, so Remember, this is a third party system. So if LC's down, then this isn't going to work. So before screaming to your IT people going, it's broken, uh, just do a search on um, actually this um, id.loc.gov and see if it comes up because sometimes it, it does go down. Um, 
it always seems to go down over the holidays. I don't know. Um, so this is a keyword search in this primary name box. Uh, so you don't actually have to start with San Diego if you don't want to. You could actually just type in super computer center and then just hit enter or click on the search button if you really like to use your mouse. Um, so I did that. And as I said, it's a keyword search. So there are 25 matches and it never happens that you that the one you want is on the first page. So you would have to scroll down. I did this on purpose because I wanted to show you that you could also search the NAF number. The NAF number is located in the 010 field of an NAF record. So if you have that information, then you could just type it. But uh, a lot of times, depending on how old the record is, there is a space between the alphabetic prefix and the actual number. And you'll want to remove that space when doing the search. So for this one, it'll be N971001 0019 and then you could do a search and it's the only one there so um frequently i have multiple monitors up and so i'll actually have the naf showing and i could just copy paste that number in here and it's much faster than having to scroll through and or even type um the heading to do searches so this is the heading I want. Um, you could click on show record and you'll can, you can see the Mark XML version of this record. Um, some things I wanted to point out on this is that it does have um, the 110. Um, it does have um, 3XX fields. It does have a 410. So there's at least one, two. It does have a 510 also. Um, those do not import over um, and are not created. So if you want to have the hierarchical superior listed, um, you will have to import that and link it yourself. Um, this is a corporate body and it does not have a biography note. But if, for example, you were doing a personal name and there was a biography note, when you imported that information, the biography note would also import into the record, which is kind of handy. They're trying to encourage people to add biography notes again, because they used to discourage people from putting in biography notes. So this is the record we want. We click on select, and then we click on import. And we could click on continue, or we could just hang out, because either way, you're going to get bounced to this page when it's. And then I could click on refresh page when it's done. And then I could quickly get to the record by just clicking on it down here. And now you could see it um, must have had a 046 special dates field. So it has the expression that uh, 1985, November 14th was when it was created and it doesn't have the ending date. So that's why that dash is there. <clears throat> So if you might want to go in and edit and change this to range if you prefer, it does have the three, well, it has the heading and it has the cross references. And I didn't have to type it. Yay. But now I want to get rid of the heading that was in there that did not have the cross references. So what you could do is merge. So you would click on merge. And in here, you would type the um, name the heading for the record. Again, this is a keyword search, so I don't have to type in San Diego. And, you know, especially if I was working in an archive in San Diego, I bet there's a lot that say San Diego. So not so many that say supercomputer. So um, click on that so that it becomes blue. And then you click on merge. And then it's more or less asks you, are you really, really, really sure you want to merge? And it's like, yes, I really, really do. So um, for, pers for agent records, not subject records, but for agent records, it allows you the opportunity to compare the agents. It, it actually doesn't give you a choice. If you want to merge, you have to compare the agents. <laughs> so 
if there was information in this record, okay, so it clearly tells you up here, this record will be updated. Um, and then it says this record will be deleted. So if there were any information in the record that's going to be deleted that I wanted added over here, I would click and put a check mark in the replace fields. And this usually happens if you, for example, have contact information on the record that already existed in archive space that you might want to move over. Um, so you would put check marks there. In this particular instance, there's nothing I want from this record except for I want my new record to be linked to the record that this one was linked to. Um, if you're paranoid, um, you could click on merge preview and it will eventually load. Probably shouldn't have clicked on that. Oh, make it go away. And it, it'll look just like this because I didn't do anything. But if you did merge, uh, preview might be a good idea to see if all of note fields you wanted moved over were actually moved over. Then you click on merge to actually have it merge the records. Now, depending on how quickly your system indexes, you'll notice it says linked records, no records found. But um, if you continue to, um, if you wait a little while, and then in these instances, wait a, even a little while longer, <laughs> then your, your records will actually show up as already linked. So that way I didn't have to go in and relink everything. It did it all behind the scenes. I didn't have to like make a list of the three records that were using it or run record that was using it, whatever. Um, so that's very, very handy. Um, and so that's how to do an agent record. For subject records, let's see. Um, let's go to show the plugin for bakeries. Let's go to the pub plugin. Plugin LCNAF imports. So let's do a subject search for, oh, so you have to change this to LCSH. And then let's do bakeries. Yes because we have that Krispy Kreme record. So it might want a lovely subject heading for bakeries. Um, and that one showed up first. I'm gonna select it and I'm gonna import it. So the import works just the same, only you have to make sure you select LCSH as opposed to LCNAF. And let's do a browse of subjects. <clears throat> And the reason I brought in bakeries is because of this heading here, bakers and bakeries, which is not a valid heading. It's actually a split. You could be a baker or you could be a bakeries, but you can't be both anymore. Um, so this heading uh, needs to be split. And let's see if we go to now bakeries is here. So I'm going to change bakers and bakeries to just bakeries, but I wanted to show you something else while we were here. So the merge button is there. You don't have to be in edit, but you could be in edit mode like this. And the merge button is also there. So I'm going to type in bakers and bakeries. So there's one. Now, unlike agent records, you could merge multiple subject records all at the same time. So remember, there was a bacteria. One would hope that bacteria is not at Krispy Kreme, but we're going to go ahead and just merge bacteria with these also. So I have bacteria. I could keep on typing all day long if I wanted to and add even more bacterial genetics. So all of those headings, I'm like, oh yeah, they all should be merged into bakeries. So I could click on merge and see this time it doesn't say compare. You don't get to compare, it's either do you want to do it or you don't want to do it? And so I'm going to say, sure. And now the only headings that are there are bakeries. See the bacteria ones are gone and the bakers and bakeries are gone. And if we click on view, it might've been enough time to, yes. So 
it added, I think the Leo Slizzard had the bacteria and Krispy Kreme had the bakers and bakeries. So both of those records are now under bakeries and we merged them. So that's pretty snazzy. Um, you could also in authority records, um, not sure why you would want to. This was kind of a proof of concept kind of thing. If you browse agents, you see this edit required fields button. So for agents, you can say, let's go to corporate entity. So you would pick what kind of agent, sort of like the templates, you can pick locally defined required fields. So if you wanted to say that the certainty date was required, or you wanted to say, oh, expression is always required, then you would put a check mark there. If under contact details, you wanted to say that salutation was always required when creating a new agent record, you would put a check mark there. And then you could save the corporate entity. So that just saved this uh, required fields box. So then when I create an agent and a corporate body, you'll notice that down here, salutation has now got this lovely pink thing. So that it's required. It indicates that it's required before you can make that. Um, and the expression now is pink instead of gray because that's required. Um, so like I said, it was a proof of concept um, because they were working on these types of um, records at the time to see if they could do it to other fields because in JIRA you'll probably see some um, questions of can I make this required, can I make that required, um, and so in theory they can, obviously it'll take some work, so at least they've proved it can be done. So there is an exercise on page 64 um, where you will be using the LCNAF plugin, plugin um, and merging some records. So let's take five minutes or so to do that. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have had during this demo. Nothing in the chat right now, but yeah, if questions arise as you do your exercise, please drop them in the chat.
Malaka, are you there? Yes. Can you show again from the agent edit page how to get to the Library of Congress plugin? Browse. Well, actually, you could get to the Library of Congress plugin at any point in Archive Space. It's um, here next to the gear. Um, you go down here to plugin and it's LCNAF import. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All righty, let's go to bulk container and location functions, which if you're following along in your handy dandy notebook is around page 65. Um, there are several operations you could uh, perform on bulk, bulk operations you can perform on top containers if you want. Um, let's click on, so up here, no, it's actually here, down by the gear, you would click on manage top containers. And you could use any of these boxes to do a search. Um, my favorite lately is this unassociated containers, um, yes or no, where you could find all the ones that, that actually are attached to something versus all the containers you've created that aren't attached to something. Um, and that's nice. Or you could do location. Um, I'm going to do a resource record search for the wayward papers. There we go. The wayward family papers. So that's in the box. You click on search. And we have some records. Woohoo! Um, one quick way to highlight all of the records if you want to is this box here. If you put a check mark in it, everything's highlighted. If you take the check mark out, nothing's highlighted. So if you wanted to just do a couple, you could do that one, skip one, and do that one. Um, again, if you wanted to delete it, you would just click the box here. You'll notice since nothing is selected, the bulk operations button doesn't work. Um, so you at least have to have one thing selected. Um, we're going to click on a couple of these. And then the bulk operations button becomes available. So there you could update your ILS holdings IDs. Um, but not really. Um, update container profiles, uh, update locations, a single location, multiple locations. You could add barcodes, which is what we frequently would use it for. You could actually merge or delete top containers um, that have been checked here also. Let's go to update ILS holdings IDs. <clears throat> if you want to change the, this would probably be like your bib ID from your um, catalog system. You, if I typed in a new number here, it would update both records at once to that new um, holdings ID. Let's see if I do barcode entry, like I said, that's the one I frequently use. You could type in a new barcode. So, um, Three three eight three eight zero one nine eight seven six four four three. Okay. Then again, all you have to do is um, 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 hit tab. And so, if you had a list, hitting tab is so much easier than actually putting it in when you're creating the boxes, in my opinion. So we usually come back after the fact and add barcodes. Um, so I could add three three eight. 
And then update these two records and continue. And now they would have their barcodes here. If I did a refresh, um, and they'd had a little bit of time. Do, do, do. Um, other things you can do. Don't, don't. Bulk operation. You could update the locations. We'll put a single location and you have a drop down. And scroll down and we can browse to the location. This database doesn't have any locations, so I would have to create a location, but then I could add locations to um, particular things, which is handy when you're like, so it was here and now we're moving it to this other building. So you can call up a whole bunch of things and quickly change their locations all in one swoop. <clears throat> so speaking of locations, let's create locations in bulk. Um, so we would click on create and we have location and then there's single location, which everybody knows what that looks like, goes on for a little while. When you create locations in bulk, batch locations, the record's a little different. Um, the top part is the same, whether it's temporary or not temporary, you would need to add a building. So we would call it main. And let's do floor, first floor, and leave the other areas blank. And then down here is where the good stuff is, the coordinate ranges. So you're gonna have to sit down, um, unless of course you have 30 repositories and you're the only person in charge. <laughs> Um, and figure out what you want to call your ranges and shelves and whatever, and how you want them counted. So for example, if you have, we'll call them two ranges on the first floor, I would say that, and that's what we're gonna call them. So R-A-N-G-E, so that's the label. Um, I'm not going to have a prefix, but if you wanted to call it, you know, blue, blue three or red three or oversize three, that's what you would use the prefix for. Or if you wanted it to be three oversized, then you would use the suffix. So you got range. Um, and let's say we have two. So the range starts at one and it goes to two because I don't want to create a million right now. <laughs> You could stop there um, and good luck finding stuff. In each of our ranges, we have sections. So you could do a coordinate range of section. And in each section, there's six shelves. And each shelf starts over again at one in a new section. Or you can give the shelves their own numbers. So in each section, let's, there's six shelves. but when you go into section two, that shell's then called shelf seven. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that's why you have uh, three of these coordinates. You don't necessarily have to use all three. Um, I'm gonna say that in my library, we just number the shelves from one to 36 or whatever um, that they have. So we'll do one through um, let's do six so that we don't make a million. So we got one through six. Now you could preview these locations. So I got main one, one and one, one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, and then two, one, et cetera. So that way I didn't have to create those by hand one at a time, it does it for me. And so since those looked okay, I'm gonna go ahead and click on create locations. And it created those. Now I'm at the location record, but let's say we weren't. So we created those and now I want to 
edit them in batch because let's say I moved half of them to floor two. So you could do a browse for locations, find the ones you want. So there are two screens worth. I'm going to say anything in range two, range two and filter that. <clears throat> and click on that and get rid of that because it gave me shelf two here, which I did not want. I just want everything in range two. And I wanna change those floors. So now that I've selected something, the edit batch button becomes available. So this will bulk update multiple records. Dun, dun, dun. And you click on edit records. And over here, it tells you the URL kind of that end part of the URL of which um, which record you're going to actually be changing. So just in case you actually have these memorized, you could go, oh, wait, I didn't want number 10. So I mean, it's helpful, but not really. <laughs> um, so let's say I wanted to make them put them all on these all on temporary exhibits. Uh, I could click on update location. And now they're all on temporary exhibits. So I could go here and I could view the record and see it says temporary and it's on exhibit. So that's a quick way to put things on and off exhibit, change the floors, change the buildings, that sort of thing. Now, the reason you need to use the preview is because you can batch delete these but it's only screen by screen. So if I had created 500 locations and I had my default set to only display 10 per page, I would have to hit delete 50 times. <laughs> so if I wanted to delete all these, I could put a check mark here, which is fast, um, and then I could hit delete. But if I go over to here and say, because I want those and I want these, it loses the the check marks from the previous screen. So I'm going to check these um, and I'll go, oh, it'll delete these. Yay. Oh, come on. There's my mouse. I was like, where is my mouse? So those are deleted, but let's go back here. Browse locations and the ones on the first page, even though I did check them, are still there. So that's how you could delete locations. Um, I have no homework for the bulk container and location functions, um, but you guys could experiment on your own. There's a couple of other nifty things that you could use to save time that, not, that are not necessarily um, archive space tools. Um, I have this thing called a 3D clipboard here, the bottom of my screen. Um, and you could set up however many captures you want it to. So anything I did a copy and paste on is here. Um, and I told it to, to um, retain, I don't know, it's more than 10. Um, and so that's very handy um, because I'm always copying and pasting. But then there's things that you could make that are sticky. So if there are... Um, and that's what these things above the fold are, but then I have so many that I have more stickies. Um, so for example, I, I do MF render italic way too often. Um, so I have that as a sticky and I could even assign it a hot key if I wanted to. Um, we have a special um, note we put if we are referring to um, things outside, uh, we, we have a PDF storage spot. So um, this one will add that note if I use it. So that's always handy. I also have um, Macro Express, um, which uh, I don't think I have on this one. On this machine, I don't have the archive space ones, but we use this to enter our notes. Um, you, it has a handy recording feature. so we go and uh, it'll go in. So we, we use a hotkey and it'll go in and type in the very long notes that we want. Um, so that way on the spawned records that don't 
put in the conditions governing access and governing um, use notes, we actually have it on uh, the macros so that the students could just go in and it does it for them. It's pretty handy. Malaka? Yes. What's that app called? The Macro Express one? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, so Macro Express, these are all my um, authority control macros. Um, I might have, let's see, file, reopen. Yes, I do have a space cleanup ones that might be on the network drive. So that'll take a while to load. Yes, call up agent record from ID. The previous one. Did you mention one before this? Yes, the previous one is um, 3D clipboard. Um, let's see. Go away. So yeah, that's the macro language in that one. Let's see about 3D clipboard. So yeah, 3D clipboard. They're both free. Well, 3D clipboard is free. Macro Express is from TechSmith, which you have to pay for. Um, and if you're going to pay for that, you might as well get um, um, Snagit, the world's best clip art for uh, documentation. You'll see that a lot in the documentation on the Help Center. <laughs> That's what I use. Um, and yeah, for that, um, let's see, actions. You could, you could also take an, um, so like if I had text that was in all uppercase, I could highlight it in my clipboard and then do lowercase on it. Um, and let's see, options, actions, help. Yeah, so if I had, so like this one was the last thing I copied. If I right click on it, I could go, oh, I want it all in uppercase. And so now it's all in uppercase instead of lowercase. I can make it sticky, which is here. And then this is where I would assign a hotkey if I wanted to. So it's pretty snazzy. That's all I got. Does anybody have any other questions, concerns? Happy to get off work early. <laughs> it's hard to get excited to get off work early when you're sitting in your house. Yeah, just moving from one room to the next. <laughs> um, no questions in the chat, but if anyone does have any last minute questions, please feel free. Um, this was such a wonderful workshop. Thank you, Malaka and Jessica. Thank you, Malaka, uh, uh, for putting <laughs> it together. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Malaka, for sort of rolling with the punches whenever um, technical things don't work, which they never do in a live. Never do. Um, but um, your uh, individual instances, like I said, they'll be available to you until the second. And as soon as we get done here, um, we're gonna make them a little bit more powerful so that you'll be able to play around with them and not worry about them crashing for then and if they if you decide you want to keep playing after they come down just go ahead and use our sandbox uh the workbook and everything that's in that google drive is yours to keep so make sure you save it and use it um, it's a really great resource um lots of people saying thank you and it's a great session in the chat malaka um <laughs> th these are all super helpful tips and great things to know about archive space so i definitely agree um, since no other questions are popping into the chat, I'll just uh, again say thank you to Malaka for this. Um, it's always great to learn new tools, so I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for attending and for sticking it out till the end. Um, don't forget there is that workshop evaluation on your agenda. I'd really appreciate it if you'd fill it out. This is the first time we've offered workshops at the online forum, and it's the first time we've offered um, so many instances and things like that. So this has definitely been a learning experience. So in, we appreciate any sort of insight that you can give us. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up day two of the online forum. Thank you so much everyone for attending and I hope to see you at the next Archive Space event. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.